So the first thing we want to talk about in 3.1 is, in fact, all of chapter 3 is going to be about the derivative. And what was our key idea when we were talking about the derivative? So what is it that the derivative represents? The slope. Slope, perfect. So f prime of x is the slope of f of x so the output of f prime of x is the slope of f of x for every x in the domain of the set, um, the domain of f, intersection with the domain of f prime. So essentially, if f and f prime both exist at a point x, then f prime of x tells us the slope of f of x at that point. So in algebra, we were only able to find the slope of lines. Using the derivative, as we talked about in chapter 2, we can now find the slope of any function whose two-sided limit exists at that point of the difference quotient. right? So that's what we built in chapter 2. Every time we wanted to find a derivative, what did we have to do? We set up the formula for the difference quotient evaluated the limit, and we found the slope. That is what is called the first principles approach. We now want to reinvent the wheel in a more efficient fashion. So let's start from the beginning and see if we can use what we learned in 2.7 to help us build some new tools, some new machinery. All right. So if we take a look at example number one, we want to talk about the derivative of a constant. So let's go ahead and draw ourselves a sketch of what this looks like and then use our key idea to help us figure this out. So if we were to draw a graph, here's our x, here's our y. If I graph y equals c, y equals c is a horizontal line, right? Because it's a constant. For every x, we're going to get the output c. So every point on that would have the form x comma c. What is the slope of this line? the slope of a horizontal line? Zero. Perfect. So then what does that tell us the derivative has to be? Yeah, so y prime would, would have to be zero. So this tells us the derivative of a constant is zero. So remember, in symbols, we can use the Leibniz notation or the operator notation. d dx of c is equal to 0. So the derivative of a constant is always 0. Well, what if we did first principles? So we have y equals c. y prime, by definition, is the limit as h goes to 0 of y of x plus h minus y of x all over h. But in this case, if we have y equals c, no matter what I put into y, what's always going to come out? c. It only knows one word. I put in 10, what do I get? c. If I put in a million, what do I get? c. If I put in x plus h, what do I get? c. So you get c minus c over h, but c minus c is 0 divided by h, which is 
here, right? So by first principles and using our limit definition, we get the same thing as we got graphically. So in general then, for some quick examples, what would d dx of pi be? Does pi ever change? No, pi is a constant. What's the derivative of a constant? Zero. Okay. And what is d dx of 1 million going to be? Well, 1 million is a constant, so what's its derivative going to be? Zero, right? No matter what the constant is, the derivative will always be zero. Okay, let's take a look at example number two. So let's go ahead and take our derivative of y equals x. Well, this one we're going to be able to figure out both graphically and we'll use first principles again. But if we were to draw a graph of y equals x, what does this look like? Once again, we have our x, we have our y, and if I graph y equals x, this is the line with y intercept zero, and what's its slope? What does m equal in y equals x? One, right? So then what would our derivative d dx of x have to be? Well, what's my slope? One. One. Perfect. What if we use the limit definition? Well, y prime would be the limit as h goes to zero of y of x plus h minus y of x all over h. Well, that's going to equal to x plus h minus x all over h. Taking my limit as h goes to zero, but I have a positive x and a negative x, and they reduce out, and h divided by h gives me one. So indeed, we get the same Thing. All right. Well, let's keep our little pattern going. So, example number three, we wish to find the derivative of y equals to x squared. So we can't draw a picture this time because it's not going to be a line, so that's not helpful. So we'll just go to our first principles. So y prime is going to be the limit as h goes to zero of y of x plus h minus y of x all divided by h. So that's the limit as h goes to zero of x plus h quantity squared minus x squared all over h. If we expand x plus h squared, we get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared all over h. So our x squareds, once again, reduce out to zero. And then we now have a common factor of h in our numerator, which we can factor out. So h, we get 2x plus h all over h. And our h reduces out. And we now have a continuous function. 
So by the evaluation theorem, we can just plug in h equals 0. So when we plug in h equals 0, we get 2x plus 0, which is just 2x. So our derivative of x squared is equal to 2x. All right, let's do one more. The derivative of x cubed. Take our derivative once again. So y prime is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of y of x plus h minus y of x all divided by h. So that's going to be x plus h cubed. minus x cubed all over h. So there's a couple of ways we can resolve this. One of them is to multiply x plus h times x plus h times x plus h out, which is probably the most simple method. Um, or we could use our difference of cubes formula. And remember, if we have a cubed minus b cubed, what is that the same as? It is a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. And that's our difference of cubes. And if you multiply it out, you will get the same thing. It's just a different way that saves us a teeny bit of time. So we take our limit as h goes to 0. And if we identify a and b, our a is going to be x plus h, and our b is just going to be plain x, we are going to end up with the following. So we have x plus h minus x times x plus h squared plus a times b. So we're going to have x plus h times x. Plus our b squared. In this case, that's just going to be x squared. Whole thing divided by h. Then some pretty cool stuff happens once again. Our x is in the first term reduce out, leaving us with the limit as h goes to 0 of h times x plus h squared plus x plus h times x plus x squared all divided by h. And then our h's reduce out, making it a continuous function. <coughs> so then we take our limit as h goes to 0. And as h goes to 0, we're going to get 0. That guy goes to 0 by the evaluation theorem. And that's going to leave x squared plus x times x is another x squared plus x squared. So this gives us that y prime is equal to x squared plus x squared plus x squared, which is 3x squared. Right? OK. So now, mathematics is the study of patterns. 
We did all of these by first principles, but when I had my opening monologue today, I said we're going to stop using first principles. So the reason we did this is we now want to look for a pattern in what happened. So let's take a look at each of these. So if we have our function and then we make a table, we're going to have its derivative. Let me center that though. So if we start with our function, when we had y equals a constant, what was our y prime? Zero. When we had y equals x, what was its derivative? y prime was 1. When we had y equals x squared, what did we get for our derivative? 2x. And when we had y equals x cubed, we just got the derivative y prime equals 3x squared. So let's make a couple of observations in what's happening. So let's talk about their degree. The degree of a constant is undefined. The degree of a linear function is 1. The degree of a quadratic function is 2. And the degree of a cubic function is 3. So let's look at, sorry, it's not undefined, it's 0. The degree of 0 is undefined. And when we have our degree of a constant, this is going to be 0. The degree of 2x is going to be 1. And the degree of 3x squared is going to be 2. So when we look at our table, when we had a function, a polynomial, or in this case specifically a monomial, when we took the derivative, what happened to its degree each time? It decreased by 1, right? So when we had a degree 0, it became undefined. When we had a degree 1, it became degree 0. Degree 2 became degree 1. And a degree 3 became degree 2. So the exponent decreased by 1. So when we don't write an exponent on a monomial, what is always there? So on this x, what is its exponent? We don't write it, it's always a 1, right? There's always a 1 there if we need it. And we'll notice something interesting. Its exponent is 1. The coefficient of its derivative is 1. What is the degree of x squared? 2. And what's the coefficient out in front of our derivative? 2. What's our exponent on our x cubed? 3, what's the coefficient out in front of our derivative? 3. Ah, this is starting to look a lot like a pattern, right? So if we had to guess, what would we guess the derivative of y equals x to the fourth? Well, what were our two observations? The degree is going to go down by 1. And what does the coefficient out in front have to become? Whatever the exponent was. So we would guess y prime is going to be 4x to the third power. And it turns out that that guess is correct. So formally, we would have to finish this proof by induction. Four examples does not a proof make, right? We've proved it works for these four specific cases. If you're interested in seeing a full proof, 
you can come to my office hours, but we won't do it in class because it's not very enlightening in terms of what we're going to do. But if you're interested, I am more than happy to show you the formal proof of how this works using first principles. What we need to know is the following. So at the top of the next page, we have our first theorem. So a theorem is something that can be proven using um, a train of either deductive or inductive logic. So where you can start with something that we all agree to be true, and then we can derive the truthfulness of the conclusion from the assumptions or the premise. So most theorems have a form of an if statement. If this, then this. The theorem or the proof of a theorem is all of the work that's in between the if and the then. Theorem is a finished product. It tells us if we can verify the premise, which is the if statement, we can assume the conclusion to be true. So for us, the purpose of our class is not to prove theorems. The purpose of our class is to learn theorems and apply them. So what that means is if we can show that the if part is true, we can use the conclusion freely. And what I mean by that, in this rule, or our theorem called the power rule, the derivative of a monomial says, if f of x is equal to x to the n, then the derivative f prime of x is n times x to the n minus 1. Well, isn't that exactly what we were doing up here? It said the derivative is the number or the exponent becomes the coefficient in front. And then what do we do? We subtract 1 from the exponent. So to get the derivative of x cubed, the 3 went out in front. That was our n. And then we subtracted 1 from the 3. 3 minus 1 is 2 becomes our new exponent. So basically what this rule is telling us now, our theorem says, if I ever see a monomial, how do I take its derivative? I move its exponent out in front and subtract 1 from the exponent. What this tells me is I no longer have to use first principles. I can use this theorem instead because I personally believe that it has been proven. right? And so we will only present true theorems in this class. So any theorem that is presented, we can assume, as long as we verify our thing fits the form of the if statement, we can use any of our theorems freely. So basically, a nice way to think about theorems is they're the rules to the game. Math is just this big, awesome game. And theorems are our rules that we can play by. They tell us what we can do. They tell us the legal operations and what happens when we use said rule. All right, so now that we've had our little primer on theorems, let's go ahead and do a couple of examples. So instead of going back to first principles and trying to expand x plus h to the seventh power, trust me, you don't want to do it. It takes a really, really long time. What's the one piece of information we need to know? Power rule. And what do we need to know to use the power rule? The exponent. What's our exponent in this case? Seven. Seven. So our derivative is going to be our exponent comes down in front, our x stays the same, and then what do we do to our exponent? We subtract 1, so 7 minus 1, so we get our derivative is 7x to the 6th power. By the way, that little intermediate step that I wrote, you don't have to write it. Right? That's just to be very explicit on what we're doing. What did we do? The net effect is the exponent came down in front, we did 7 minus 6, 
or 7 minus 1, which gives us 6, right? So our derivative is 7x to the sixth power. From now on, we will never use first principles. Well, not never. We are very rarely ever going to use first principles, and it's pretty much mostly going to be me when I'm showing you how to differentiate something new. We will prove our theorem using first principles, and then we will use our theorem from there on out. Okay, it's a you try. I want you guys to take the derivative of r to the fifth power, not using first principles. Mr. Peterson? Yes, ma'am. What does that like first part? All right, so hopefully we've all computed our derivative because it is much quicker now. So what is d dr of r to the fifth power? We bring our 5 down in front, and 5 take away 1 is 4. So our derivative is 5r to the fourth power. OK. So let's take a look at example c. So we look at this, and what's our derivative going to be? Perfect, 0. Because what is 2 to the 10th power? It's a constant. If you multiply 2 to the 10th power, what do you get? 1,024, right? So this is a constant. And the derivative of a constant is always 0. So what was the difference between example C and examples A and B? Examples A and B both had variables. We'll also notice this tells us what we were taking the derivative with respect to. We were differentiating with respect to x. Are there any x's in that statement? No. So it makes it a constant. All right. So in the derivation of our rule, we assumed when we went pattern hunting that all of our exponents were positive whole numbers, a.k.a. we were using monomials and polynomials. Turns out that the power rule can be generalized to where things are not positive whole numbers. We will accept this generalization without proof. And once again, if you really, really want to see the generalized proof, I'm more than happy to do so. Just come to my office hours and we can work through it. But once again, I'll inform you that it's not very enlightening to see the proof. We can prove that it works, but the basic idea is we expand it from the natural numbers to the rational numbers, and then we have to use limits to expand it to irrational numbers. So it's a bit of work, but you can bootstrap your way up is really what's happening. So the power rule in general allows us to use any real number exponent. With one exception. n cannot equal to negative 1, and we'll see why in a minute. We may need to use the law of exponents to rewrite in the form x to the r, where r is a real number. And then, just the same as before, d dx of x to the r is going to be r times x to the r minus 1. So basically, we are going to assume 
as long as the exponent is not negative 1, sorry, this does not have the exception. I'm thinking of something else. So no exception. We can always use this rule. The exception occurs in the inverse operation that we'll talk about later. So there is an exception, but it's not here. All right. So now that we have this, let's go ahead and apply our generalized rule to the following. And as mentioned, we may need to rewrite using laws of exponents. So the first thing we're going to need to do is rewrite using a negative exponent. So if we have 1 over x raised to the n, that is the same as x to the negative n. That's our exponent law. We usually use it in the other direction. If we have a negative exponent, we move it from the numerator into the denominator and make the exponent positive. But we need to have something of the form x raised to the r. So we can rewrite this as f of x is equal to x to the negative 1. So now we take our derivative, f prime of x says we bring our exponent down in front. So we're going to have a negative 1, and I'm going to write it out long ways this time, times x. And then I have negative 1 take away 1. So this gives me negative x to the negative 2, and then rewriting by putting our exponent back down into the denominator we would get negative 1 over x squared. So the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. The way we accomplished this is we had to rewrite it as a monomial. So we brought our x to the numerator by changing our exponent from a positive number to a negative number and then applied our rule. We brought the number down in front and we subtracted 1. The same rule we were using before, right? Just a little algebra in between. This, so the first thing we do is we rewrite it as x to the negative third. So then our derivative, f prime of x, is going to be negative 3 times x to the negative 3 take away 1 gives us negative 4. So then cleaning up, we get negative 3 over x to the power. So it's the same rule. We bring the number down in front and subtract 1 from the exponent. OK, so let's take a look at our next one, and you're probably saying, well, it's got a radical in it. So there's another exponent law that we may need to remember, which is our fractional exponents. So if we have the b root of x raised to the a power, this is the same as x raised to the a divided by b. And that's our fractional exponent rule. So in this example, we will note that our b is 3 and our a is 2. So then according to this, we are going to get x raised to the 2 thirds power, right? So the cube root of x squared is the same as x raised to the 2 thirds power. So now we want to calculate our derivative. 
So we're using the same rule. So what happens to our exponent? The 2 thirds comes down in front. And then we have x. And I'm going to write this one out the long way. 2 thirds take away 1. So that's 2 thirds times x. 2 thirds take away 1 is the same as 2 thirds take away 3 thirds. So we get negative 1 third. That is a perfectly good derivative. If we wish, we could do the same thing. Bring the negative exponent down into the denominator. So then it becomes x to the 1 third. And then by the fractional exponent rule, we could rewrite it as the cube root of x. right? Because 1 third, the denominator becomes the index on the radical. The numerator becomes the power on the radicand. But anything raised to the first power is just a 1. So x to the first power is just x. So if it helps, put the 1 there. But then you can simplify the 1 out because we don't write it when it's a 1. And just as a note, what is the index on a square root when we don't write it? So it's worth noting, if we have the square root of x, what is that as a fractional exponent? 1 half, right? So the index by default when not written is always a 2. So a square root has an index of 2. If we want an index other than 2, like in the previous example, a cube root, we will write it explicitly, stating that it is a 3 or a 4 or whatever number we wish for it to be. All right. So didn't quite fit on this page, but if you get to the top of the next page, you will notice there is a U try for you guys. So go ahead and calculate the derivative of the fifth root of x cubed. All right, so let's do this. So we rewrite this as x to the 3 fifths power. So then our derivative f prime of x is going to be 3 fifths times x raised to the 3 fifths take away 1. So we get a common denominator. So 3 minus 5 over 5 gives us negative 2 fifths. So that is a perfectly good derivative. By the way, if you type that into WebAssign, it'll be very happy. You can also simplify it up a bit more if you feel so inclined as 5x to the positive 2 fifths and then 3 divided by 5 the fifth root of x squared. WebAssign will actually take all three of those. So WebAssign is super easy going when it comes to equivalent mathematical expressions. So fun fact, um, WebAssign actually runs Maple in the background. And so it will do an algebraic symbolic compare of your solutions. So unless you're specifically asked to put something in a certain form, it will accept anything that is algebraically equivalent. I've only ever ran into one problem with Maple not recognizing equivalent forms, and that's from Calc 2. And it required some crazy log and trig identities that apparently stumped one of the algorithms in Maple. So for the most part, you don't need to overly simplify your answers. So I would recommend not doing so because there's no reason to. As we'll discover, simplification in calculus becomes a little more subjective. Simplified really depends on what you're trying to do because in algebra, they would always tell you never leave a negative exponent, right? But what's the first thing we need to do if we're taking a derivative? Make something have a negative exponent. So which of those is going to be more beneficial? Well, it depends. What am I trying to accomplish? So a lot of the stuff that we practiced a ton in algebra becomes less important, and we need to focus on what's our end goal and write things in the appropriate form to get from A to B. So 
as we'll see, simplification becomes more of, well, what form do I need it in to accomplish what I want to do? And that's simplified. So don't overly simplify things. And what I mean by overly simplify is don't fall back on all our algebraic reasoning all the time and try to rewrite everything the way we used to. Because most of the time, it actually just creates more work that we're not going to need. So if you keep rewriting everything in this fully simplified form, what if we have to take another derivative? What are you going to have to do? Reverse the whole process, and it saves you zero time, right? So one of the things that's really different that we're going to start seeing from here on out is simplification, as I mentioned, is subjective. So simplify till it makes sense. And I know that's a super unappealing answer because you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, as you start doing some of these problems, you will find good places to stop, AKA usually after you've applied your theorem and depending on where we're going to go. And we'll see some examples as we move forward on simplifying things depending on what it is we're trying to do. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about is we need to generalize this rule. So, so far, we've only been able to take derivatives of monomials, but there hasn't been any coefficient in front, right? It's just been x raised to some power. Well, our next theorem is called the constant multiple rule. If f is a differentiable function and c is any real number, then the derivative of c times that function is we can pull the constant out of the derivative, take the derivative as normal, and then just multiply by the constant. This rule should look really familiar. We had this rule for limits, right? So we could pull constants out of limits, evaluate the limit, and then multiply by it at the end. So the limit of the product was the product of the limits. The same thing is true for constants and derivatives. Because where did derivatives come from? Limits. They inherit all of those properties that we were studying. Remember those six properties we had for limits? Derivatives will inherit those because derivatives are based on limits from first principles. So we're going to inherit a whole bunch of the same machinery that we had. And we will use that to our advantage. So let's see how we can apply this rule. So we want to find our derivative. So we have the derivative f prime of x is equal to d dx of 3x squared. But by our constant multiple rule, it says if I have a constant times a function, what do I do? The constant comes out. So I have 3 times the derivative d dx of x squared. So essentially, we can just pull constants out, ignore them essentially, and then what's the derivative of x squared? 2x, right? So then we have 3 times 2x, which gives us 6x. So the derivative of 3x squared is going to be 6x. What was the net effect? We did essentially the same thing. The constant didn't affect the derivative in any way. We brought the 2 down in front. What's 3 times 2? 6. Ah, what was the coefficient out in front? 6. And what did we do to our exponent? We decreased it by 1. So our rule just says constants just kind of come along for the ride. You can pull them out in front, do your regular derivative, and then just multiply back at the end. All right, let's try our next one. So what's our constant that we have out in front this time? Negative 1, right? So negative 1, d dx, x, and what's the derivative of x? Well, it's 1. So negative 1 times 1 is negative 1, right? All right, 
So let's go ahead and take our derivative here. So we pull our constant out. So 4 thirds is a constant, pi is a constant, so d dr of r cubed. So that gives us 4 thirds times the derivative of r cubed is going to be 3 times r squared. 3's reduce out, and we get our derivative then is going to be 4 pi r squared. So the derivative of 4 thirds pi r cubed is going to be 4 pi r squared. So I mentioned that this is the volume of a sphere. Does anybody recognize this formula? 4 pi r squared? That's the surface area. Turns out that this formula generalizes, so it's interesting. So what does that say? The rate of change of the volume of a sphere is equal to its surface area. Hmm. It's interesting. So fun fact, this is only true for spheres. And what I mean by that, spheres in any dimension. So what do we call a two-dimensional sphere? A circle, right? So what's the area formula for a circle? Pi r squared, right? So d dr times pi r squared would be pi times d dr of r squared. So that's going to be 2r. So that gives us 2 pi r. And what's 2 pi r in terms of a circle? Circumference, right? It works in four dimensions, five dimensions, six dimensions, 133 dimensions. This is why nature loves spheres. They're very efficient. And if you take some physics classes, they'll talk about that. But spheres are the only thing that has this property that the rate of change of their volume is proportional to their surface area is what this is really telling us. And it's only circles and spheres in any dimension that that works for. That's why nature tends to make things spherical. It likes spheres. They're energy efficient. All right, the next rule we want to talk about is the sum indifference rule. So with limits, if you had the sum of the limits, what could you do? Calculate each of the limits independently and then add them up, right? Same thing is true for derivatives. So if f and g are differentiable functions, then the derivative of f of x plus g of x is the same as the derivative of f of x plus the derivative of g of x. So the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. The derivative of the difference is the difference of the derivatives. This allows us to expand our monomial rule to polynomials, because what is a polynomial? A sum of monomials. So if it works on monomials, this rule says we can now just use that rule on each of the parts independently. So our derivative behaves very, very nicely with respect to addition and subtraction. All right, so find the derivative f of x equals 5x cubed plus 2x squared minus 7x plus 9. So our derivative rule, the long way, says the following, that this is the same as f prime of x is equal to 5 d dx x cubed plus 2 d dx x squared minus 7 d dx x plus d dx of 9. So I actually used both rules, right? Our first rule says that if I have a constant for a derivative, what do I do? Pull it out. Then my second rule says I can do it to all of the parts separately. 
So what's the derivative of x cubed? 3x squared. So we get 15x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x, so plus 4x. The derivative of x is 1 minus 7, and the derivative of a constant is 0. So putting all of that together, we get that f prime of x is equal to 15x squared plus 4x take away 7. So the first note, you don't need to write out that very first line like I did, right? In fact, you don't want to. What was the net effect? You just bring the exponent down in front and multiply. So what was 5 times 3? So we had our 5 and we had our 3. What does that give us? 15. We had our 2 and our 2. What did that give us? 4. The derivative of an x is just 1. If you want to think of it, you bring the 1 down in front. 7 times 1 is 7. And 1 minus 1 is 0. And what's anything raised to the 0 power? Right. So our derivative rule is consistent. And that is, in practice, how we're going to want to calculate derivatives. The theorems tell us we can. And we choose to believe the theorems because they're awesome. And then we take our derivatives because it makes our life a lot easier. If you don't believe me, set up the limit definition for this. And after about 10 minutes, you'll probably be like, yeah, no. Not doing that. I'll just use my power rule. Thank you very much. All right. What's our derivative f prime of 9 plus x or 9 plus pi cubed going to be? Zero, because it's a constant, right? 9 is a constant, pi is a constant, so the derivative of a constant is zero. All right, last one's for you guys. All right, so to resolve this, we use our rule, so f prime of x is going to be 2x plus 10. The derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of 10x is just 10. So awesome. All right, so what we've been witnessing is formally called, the derivative is what is called a linear operator. That is, if c is any real number and f and g are differentiable functions, then the derivative of a linear combination, so c times f of x plus g of x, is equal to the end result, which is c times the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. So basically, when we say something is a linear operator, it means it satisfies that property that you can pull constants out and you can break it up over sums and differences. We will have occasion to study other linear operators as well. The one difference between a linear operator and a function is, notice, we input a function, and what do we get out? Another function. The derivative itself is a linear operator. We put in a function, and we get out a function. Up until this point, we've studied mostly functions where we put in numbers, and we get out numbers. Sometimes we put in expressions and get out expressions. But now we put in a function, it transforms that function into a new function. So in the context of the previous example, the linear operator differentiation transformed x squared plus 10x minus 9 into a new function, its derivative, 2x plus 10. Right? So we've just generalized the idea of a function, and that's what the derivative is. Instead of putting in numbers and getting out numbers, we put in a function and we get out a new function. All right. Next example, find the points on the curve y equals um, 4x cubed plus 5x squared minus 12x plus 3, where the tangent line is horizontal. So what is this really asking us to find? Well, the tangent line, remember, has the same slope as the curve. And if it's horizontal, what's the slope of a horizontal line? 
zero. So we want to know where the slope is zero. Well, the slope is the derivative. So what is it we really want? We want x when y prime is equal to zero. That's what it's asking, right? We want to find the point x where y prime, or the derivative, which is the slope, is zero. All right, so first thing we're going to need then is the derivative. So let's calculate y prime. So the derivative of 4x cubed is 12x squared. The derivative of 5x squared is 10x. The derivative of negative 12x is negative 12. And the derivative of a constant is zero. So now we need to solve y prime equals zero. So 12x squared plus 10x minus 12 is equal to zero. So let's go ahead and factor this. Our GCF is two, and that leaves six x squared plus five x minus six is equal to zero. So we need factors of a times c, so six times negative six, so negative 36 that add up to five. So our winners are going to be nine and negative four because nine times negative four is 36 and nine plus negative four is five. So that's going to give us our cross terms. So we have six x squared plus nine x take away four x take away six is equal to zero. And then we factor by grouping. So in our group one, we have a GCF of 3x, and that leaves behind 2x plus 3. Our GCF in the second group is negative 1. Nope, negative 2. And that leaves behind 2x plus 3. We now have the common binomial 2x plus 3. So we get 2x plus 3 times 3x minus 2. If you factor using the guess and check method, that's fine as well. And if you just hate factoring and use the quadratic formula, that's great too, right? You're going to get the same answer either of the three ways that you do this. So then our x value is negative 3 halves, or our x value is 2 thirds. So those are the two points where our graph has a horizontal tangent line. So let's go ahead and graph this thing. So we put in 4x cubed plus 5x squared minus 12x plus 3, and let's graph. Let me change our window up a little bit. So I'm going to make my x min negative 2. I'm going to make my x max positive 2. And let's scale this in. Point fives. And then let's make our y min five and our y max positive 15 and we'll leave it in ones. Apparently I didn't go out far enough. Not one of the two but not the other one. Well, let's make our y max a little bit better. Let's go to 20. There we go. So we found these two points. So at negative 3 halves, that's right here. If we go up to our graph, what do we notice about its slope? 
What is it equal to? Zero. And these are a half, so there's a half, one, one and a half. So this one says at two thirds, which is about right there. We also see our slope is zero. So we'll talk more about this later, but when something has slope zero at our red point, what do we notice our graph has? A local maximum. And at our blue point, what do we notice our graph has? A local minimum. Interesting. Oh, that's because in terms of physics, what does the derivative tell us again? So if we have position, what's the derivative of position? Velocity. And what's the derivative of velocity? Acceleration, right? So when we set our derivative equal to zero, what does that tell us? That something stopped. Oh, if I throw a ball up into the air, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up. But before it can come back down, what does it have to do? Stop has velocity zero, and then it starts coming back down towards the Earth. That's exactly what our derivative is telling us. Very, very interesting. So speaking of velocities and accelerations, I want you guys to do the following you try. So if you have the following function that represents position, find the velocity of this particle and find the acceleration of this particle. All right, so the derivative of position is velocity. So our velocity function, v of t, is going to be s prime of t. So we take the derivative of s and we get 6 t squared minus 10t plus 3. So then to find the acceleration function, acceleration is the derivative of velocity or the second derivative of position. So they're both going to be the same. So s double prime is going to be the same as v prime, but it's easier to just take the derivative of v, which would give us 12t take away. All right, so then our next example builds on what we were just doing. It says use the previous U try to answer the following two questions. So find the acceleration after three seconds and find the acceleration when the velocity is zero. Well, our acceleration function is this guy. So to find the acceleration after three seconds, we put in t equals three. So a of three is 12 times three take away 10, which is going to be 36 take away 10 gives us 26. And then our units from the previous problem are meters per second squared. So our acceleration is going to be 26 meters per second squared at 3 seconds. Part B says, find the acceleration when the velocity is 0. So the first thing we need to do is solve v of t is equal to 0. Well, that's going to be 6t squared minus 10t plus 3 is equal to zero. Turns out this one is not going to factor, so the only thing we're going to be able to do is use our quadratic formula. So a is six, b is negative 10, and c is three. So I'm gonna grab my calculator and I am going to go 6, and I'm going to save that in my calculator as A. I am going to go negative 10, and I am going to save that in my calculator as B. 
and I'm going to go three, and I'm going to store that in my calculator as C. So then <coughs> I can calculate what I need. So I have, I go alpha y equals to get my fraction, and the quadratic formula is negative b, and I'll do the positive one first, plus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, all divided by 2 times a. And I hit enter, and that gives me my first value. I'm going to store that as say z in my calculator. So I'm already using a, b, and c. And then I'm going to need to do the same thing to get the other one, right? Because the quadratic formula has both a plus and a minus, right? So you can pull up what you have done before by going second enter, second enter again, and then you can just go back and edit that formula and change our plus sign that we have to a minus. Scroll back, change it from positive to negative, we get this value. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to store that one. I've already used z, so let's use y this time. And save this guy into my calculator to use later. And then we want to find the acceleration when the velocity is zero. So I'm going to go y equals, and I am going to put my acceleration function in. And our acceleration function was 12x take away 10, right? So then I can do each of these evaluations by going alpha trace y and then I'm going to put in my z value by just typing z. And then I go alpha trace y1, and I'm going to put in my y value that we just saved. And we get each of these values. So it tells us that, that when the velocity is 0, our acceleration is 5.291 and negative 5.291 and so forth. So we can save values into our calculator using this button right here, store, and then the alpha key to save them as letters. I find it easier when using the quadratic formula to just store them in my calculator and use it to solve than trying to type all of that stuff in. Because almost inevitably, I almost always make a sign error. I would also strongly recommend you use the alpha y equals to make fractions when doing the quadratic formula. It will save you a bunch of grief, right? So I know you guys know how to use the quadratic formula. So what I'm really telling you is I don't want you doing this stuff by hand because you're going to pull a Professor Peterson at some point and do 2 plus 2 equals 10 and get the wrong answer. Just type it into your calculator. That's why we have it to offload some of these computations. All right. So now we're going to talk about a different function and its derivative. So The derivative of an exponential function. So the derivative of e to the x is, drum roll please, e to the x. Well, that's interesting. The exponential function with Euler's base has the unique property that when you take its derivative, you get exactly the same function back. What does that tell us about exponential growth then? 
what's the slope of the exponential function at every point? Well, it's equal to its own y value. Because if it's its own derivative, that means its slope or its rate of change at every point x is equal to the original function's output, which is its y value. So exponential growth is very, very interesting in that case. So it turns out that if it's not base e, the derivative d dx of a to the x for a not equal to e is the natural logarithm of a times a to the x. So the derivative of e to the x, this is our favorite derivative because the derivative d dx of e to the x is e to the x. If the base is anything but e, we get a normalizing factor of the natural logarithm of a. We will accept this derivative without using first principles. I will make the same offer for this one as I do to all of the other ones. If you really want to see it, come to my office hours. I'll be more than happy to show it to you. Not very informative, but the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. All right. So let's go ahead and use this. to calculate some derivatives. So the derivative of e to the x plus 2x, I'll be a little more verbose than usual, is going to be the derivative d dx of e to the x plus 2 times the derivative d dx of x using our rules. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and the derivative of 2x is once again, you don't have to include that middle step, right? Because we know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and the derivative of 2x is going to be 2. So the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, so we get e to the x plus 2. The next one looks a little scary, because how many derivatives does it want me to take? A thousand. But luckily, what's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. So if I do that a thousand times, what am I still going to end up with? e to the x, right? Because if I differentiate e to the x, I get e to the x. And if I do that a thousand times, I still get e to the x. Okay, so then what's going to be the derivative of 2 to the x plus 3 to the x? Well, remember this one, our rule is we multiply by the base and we get 2 to the x plus we multiply by the base times 3 to the x. So that's our corollary rule right here. The derivative of a raised to the x is the natural logarithm of a times a to the x. So e to the x gives us e to the x back. If we take the derivative of the natural log or of a to the x, we get the natural log of the base times the base, right? Okay, so for your U try, how many times are we going to be taking the derivative? Well, once again, a thousand. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can find a pattern. So if we do d dx of 5 to the x, that gives us the natural log of 5, 5 to the x. So then if we take another derivative of this, the natural logarithm of 5 is a constant, so we pull it out in front, times the derivative d dx of 5 to the x, but we know what that derivative is. It's the natural log of 5 times 5 to the x. So at the end of the day, when I took the second derivative, how many factors of the natural logarithm of 5 do I have? 2. And if I did that again, how many factors am I going to have? 3. If I did it again, how many factors am I going to have? Four. So if I do this a thousand times, how many factors am I going to have? A thousand times five to the x. 
right? So that would be our pattern. 